Okay, <clears throat> our next speakers are Sasha Sivanovich, I hope I say that right, uh, from the University of Ljubljana, and Peter Ludlow from the University of Campinas. Their talk is titled The Zero Interface. Yeah, uh, thank you, Rafael. Uh, I will correct you in the pronunciation of my name. I will actually also correct Peter, so that's okay. Yeah, Sasha Zivanovic. <laughs> it's a it's a tough one, I know, with lots of stuff on, on top of our letters. <clears throat> uh, so yeah, this talk is uh, together with Peter, uh, but Peter is going to sit this one out because he had his fun yesterday and actually uh, really did a very good philosophical basis for what I'm about to say today, um, so that I can focus, uh, let's say, on technical details, which suits me just well, uh, because uh, you know I'm this mathematician converted to linguist a long, long time ago. So I let him do the philosophy and um, concentrate on other stuff. So uh, what do, do we want to talk about today is about the syntax semantics interface. So the question here is, how, how do we get from the syntactic representation, you know, typically this will be the logical form, uh, to the semantic representation, which is either a first order logic or even more usually a generalized quantifiers formula. And now the, the received wisdom is that there is a computation involved here, right? Uh, and this computation is implemented by Lambda Calculus. Now we will actually present a different thesis uh, as you might imagine from Peter's talk. And that is that there's actually nothing to do. We're already there once we have our syntactic representation. So we have the zero interface. So more specifically, we will argue for this view uh, that there is no need for ha to have a mapping between syntactic and semantic representation because LF is actually already a formula of first order logic. Now, all this is stuff that we say in our recent book, Language, Form and Logic. And um, yeah, there is many more details here than I can possibly present here in 40 minutes. So I'll just try to give you a broad picture of how we implement this and hopefully you will be interested to read the book. Uh, so let's start with uh, how the standard interface uh, looks like and how it fits into the minimalist architecture of the faculty of language. So we have this appealing picture, I think, uh, where LF is supposed to be the point where the faculty of language connects to conceptual intentional systems. However, once standard semantics enters the picture, I believe it is fair to say that it introduces an extra level of representation. Let me call it semantic form here. Uh, Peter called it the language of thought. I don't really care. There's something extra here. Um, and um, we need to get somehow from the logical form to the semantic form. And this somehow is usually via lambda calculus. So we take our syntactic structure, uh, we look up the denotations in, of the terminals, and then we recursively compute the denotation of the root. And the question I would like to ask is, why do we need this mapping at all? And the answer is actually very obvious because the starting point and the end point are really different things, right? Um, well, I have chosen here the GQ representation uh, as the as the endpoint because this is sort of a standard thing, right? Uh, but our idea here is actually perhaps the start and the endpoint would not be all this different if we chose some other system, let's say first or the logic. Uh, but so people have already been asking themselves this question, you know, is predicate logic isomorphic to uh, the logical form of the minimalist theory? And you know, the typical answer is no. And this answer is usually even taken to suggest it's, it's like an argument against using first order logic, or logic as a formal language of the semantic theory, which, you know, in my opinion, is a little bit unfair because nobody has ever said, oh, GQ is not appropriate as the formal language because it's not isomorphic to, to syntax, right? But leaving this aside, um, okay, these two trees are not isomorphic. You can see this because, you know, uh, if you look at dog and barking, they are on different branches of the root node in the LF, not here in the logical form. Um, the effect of the determiner uh, 
is kind of smeared across this tree. You have existential here and you have the conjunction here. So not isomorphic, right? But you know, if we remember that quantification is always restricted, then perhaps you know we are getting towards a prettier picture where the two trees will start to correspond. And we will actually go further along this way than this formula that I've shown here and um, actually claim that there is an isomorphism if we take a good version of predicate logic as our formal language. Uh, however, before we go there, we really need to address the question of affability. Uh, because you know it is commonly assumed that predicate logic is simply not expressive enough to cover all the meanings that we need to cover. So the canonical case is most. Let me also read a quote, right? From Barways and Cooper in their seminal work on generalized quantifiers. Consider the case of more than half. It is a routine application of familiar techniques in first order logic to prove that this cannot be defined from the universal and existential quantifier. One has to leave traditional first order uh, logic in one of two ways. One might mirror the high order set theoretic definition of more than half in the semantics by forcing every domain E to contain all of the abstract apparatus of modern set theory. A different approach, one that model theorists have found more profitable is to keep the formal definition as part of the meta language and treat generalized quantifiers without bringing all the problems of set theory into the syntax and semantics of logic per se. Hmm. We definitely agree here that this different approach was totally profitable yeah, and really, really fruitful. And we also agree with Weierweiss and Cooper that you know, forcing all the set theory into our formal language would be kind of an overkill, right? Um, however, and, and this I think is, was also Peter's point partially yesterday, um, Barbies and Cooper, Barbies and Cooper didn't really, you know, they were not into psychological reality, yeah? but we are into psychological reality of, of our semantic proposals. So if we simply take set theory and push it away, so put it into the meta language or wherever, uh, then we are not really solving the problem. Then we are sort of, you know, it's just becoming somebody else's problem, this set theory. So we are actually asking yourself the question, is there a middle road, you know? Uh, is there some extension of first order logic which would be expressive enough to do most and friends, uh, but you know, it wouldn't be the entire set theory. It would be something a bit more palatable perhaps. And we believe there is a middle road and we call it El Nova. Yeah? We call it El Nova because it used to be called El Star, the previous version of this, this language. And then this star you know, exploded and went Nova. So now it has two stars and it's an El Nova. And you can think of it either as a myriological theory or you can think of it as a plural logic. This is actually what we prefer. So the logic where a variable can refer to more than one individual. And let me show you how we do most in this, in this language. So we are not seeing most as an undecomposable primitive, but rather we will build it from different pieces of uh, the syntax of formal language. So we'll need an existential quantifier and we will need the disjointness predicates, like when two things are disjoint, they don't overlap, which can be defined off of the among relation central to plural logic, and we'll need a way to count. So if I start with the, the latter thing, so how do we envision counting? Um, look at the formula here. So the idea is not to say that five directly applies to X, saying that X is a size of five. No, the idea is that five applies to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to the special variable N. So we have this numeral N, um, and then we have this hash predicate, this is a quantity predicate that actually say, X is N in number. So it's a bit of a roundabout way, but actually it works even better, as you'll see. Uh, then to give you an example of where the jointness is, is interesting. You're all familiar with the Russellian analysis of the. Uh, so here we've got the inequality, which brings in uniqueness, as you're totally aware of. Now we replace this inequality with this jointness, and we will get maximality. And this way, 
the analysis of the will actually become useful both for singular and for plural noun phrases. So the way I like to read this formula is, you know, so we've got the, the, these X's, they are cats, and we don't have other cats. So there is no Y, which would be cats, but disjoint from X, so no other cats. And a similar trick is going to be very useful for the analysis of most as well. It's just that now we're going to bring in cardinality as well and say we, so we will kind of remember the, the cardinality of X here and store it into the variable N. And then we will say, oh, but we don't have N other cats. So the same number as X. Uh, and you can see how this works is so if you're going to take your X, which has more than five cats, of, sorry, more than half cats, five in this case, of course you can't five, find five other cats. But if you choose a bad X, such that you cannot possibly satisfy this, like four, then of course you can find four other cats. So this is how we actually can implement most from the little pieces of, uh, of our formal language. And hopefully this also convinces you uh, that, okay, predicate logic, some extension of it, is enough to do natural language, or at least most. But let us go back to, uh, to our isomorphism problem. So remember what I'm really trying to do here is I'm trying to match the LF and the uh, predicate logic formula. And really what got in the way earlier were quantifiers. So let's say goodbye to quantifiers. <laughs> and by this, I don't want to say, let's say goodbye to quantification. Of course, we want to have quantification. But the idea is that we will implement quantification without ever using explicit quantifier symbols. Yep. Uh, so this is a, a long and winding road, actually, that, you know, takes half of the book or possibly even more. So how do we start in, in our book? We actually start from the perspective of natural logic. Uh, so there is this thing that we call the holy grail of medieval logicians, and that's to reduce the set of valid Aristotelian syllogisms down to two inference rules. So substitution for a wider or a narrower predicate. And well, Medieval logicians couldn't really work this out totally, but these days using modern tools, it's very easy to see that if we only allow for Boolean connectives, negation, conjunction, disjunction, then uh, dictum de omni will only apply under positive and dictum de nullo will only apply under negative polarity. Um, but we go further than that and we actually then develop a our own deductive system that we call dynamic deductive system that is sound, that is complete, and that kind of works in the spirit of these two rules, dictum de omni and dictum de nullo, in the sense that, as we will see, uh, it can do the same as here, so dog replaced by animal, animal replaced by dog, so the replacements, the substitutions can take place inside the formula. So one feature of our DDS is that rules are deep, they are inline rules, they can work anywhere inside of the formula. And you can, as you can see from the list of these rules here, well, don't read prune yet because you have no idea what it is, but copy, delete, and add, you can kind of imagine. These are very, very simple, dumb operation. We say the kind of sublogical operations. And as we will see, because they are sensitive to polarity, that's where the logic comes from. Um, by the way, so we have one more like interface rule, you know, bringing in the axioms, and we have one single axiom, <laughs> truth. <laughs> That's easy, right? So let me show you how these rules work. Let's first start with add and, and delete. So delete is really similar to classical simplification, uh, which removes a conjunct, but here we only remove a conjunct if we are under positive polarity. If we are under negative polarity, we actually remove a disjunct. Now, add is going to be just the reverse in some way, a dual. So addition, classical addition, introduces a conjunct. But here we will introduce a real, sorry, uh, a disjunct. There should be a disjunct here. Uh, add, our add, introduces a disjunct in positive polarity environments, but then it flips to introducing a conjunct in negative polarity environments. So this way you see how our rules are sensitive to polarity. And there is another feature of our system. It is that it is sort of dynamic. 
um, in the sense that we are only operating on one formula and that formula we kind of change through time and we don't have to know anything about the history of the deduction in order to perform it. Let me show you how this looks like. So I've got two premises, every pet is a dog, every dog is an animal. Okay, actually one premise because I can join them. And what I wanna do here is substitute uh, animal for dog. So this DX, I wanna get AX here. How will I do that? First, I will take uh, the, uh, the, the second premise, so to speak, and bring it closer to the replacement site by copying it there. Done, copy it. And then I will do this operation prune, which I will explain in a sentence here. So this dx, the upper one, is in some way positive. You don't know how yet. The lower thing, the lower dx in some is negative because there is only a single negation under it. So it has negative polarity. And these two constitute a sort of a conflict. And because of that conflict, I can delete the lower dx, well, up to the disjunction, done. Finally, remember deletion works in, uh, uh, deletes a conjunct in a positive context. I can delete this, done. And I have achieved my goal. Now, however, there is one little piece of the puzzle that I haven't told you yet, and it is called premise scope or p-scope for, for short. And this p-scope is a relation that governs the application of copy and prune. Namely, copy and prune are both rules which kind of there is an interaction between a premise and the target site, right? And now it's uh, it's not as if I can copy anything anywhere. You know, there are of course limits to that, and uh, uh, well, we call these limits p scope. Basically, if something p scopes of something else, I can copy it there. Or more in in general, I can use it as a premise of a rule targeting the other thing. So premise scope is the scope of a constituent in the role of a premise. But now the crucial thing here, of course, is how do we syntactically characterize speed scope? So how do we recognize it mechanically? And uh, well, because our book starts with you know, medieval logicians, we have decided to present this using a medieval allegory. So please bear with me and imagine if you will that a formula is a medieval kingdom. Yeah. And uh, now at the south of this kingdom, we have our villages, which are really atomic formulas. And the other branches uh, are towns. And then at the very north, we have Camelot because, you know, Camelot doesn't really do any work for us, but we like to have it there, so Camelot. There are also, of course, roads, these branches in this kingdom. And very importantly, you can only travel in this kingdom on the roads because, you know, airplanes were not invented yet, obviously, Middle Ages. This is our main protagonist, Percival. He's the guy who will tell us who p-scopes over what. Yeah? And uh, how this will go about is we will send him on a mission. He will need to bring some plans from the premise into the target town. Yeah? And if his mission is successful, we will say, oh God, okay, we've got P-scope. If the mission is unsuccessful, nope, no P-scope. But now the thing is, you know, uh, his travels, obviously there must be some obstacles, otherwise, um, yeah, he would tell us nothing. So the thing is like this, in the towns of this kingdom, we've got supernatural beings. For one, we've got angels. Angels live in universal quantifiers and they live in conjunctions and they like gold. So they will only let Percival into their town if he's wearing a golden armor. But there's a little thing here. This only applies if he travels from the south because you know the checkpoints, the armor checkpoints are only located at the southern gates. And then we've got demons. These guys live in disjunctions and existential quantifiers and they like silver, and they will only let Percival enter if he's wearing his silver armor. Negations, it's uh, where al alchemists live, and alchemists will always let Percival into their town, but they are very naughty, and they will change his, uh, his armor from gold uh, into silver if he shows up in gold, but if he shows up in silver, they will change it to golden armor. So, You've got it all. Let's see Percival in action. 
Um, this will be an example of a successful mission which will indicate peace code. This is the same example as earlier. It's the first step of the previous example. So we kind of want to copy this disjunction next to this dx, but we have to first ask Percival if this is allowed. So let's hand him on his mission. He starts at a disjunction wearing his golden armor. Then he arrives at a universal quantifier still wearing his golden armor, arrives at the conjunction still wearing his golden armor, and then he can go down all the way to dx. Why? Because remember, the checkpoints were only at the southern gate. So going south is never a problem. So Percival reached the destination. We can copy this stuff here as we did before. It's allowed. Let me also give you an unsuccessful mission. So let me see, let's, let's try to copy PX to AX here. So to replace every dog is uh, an animal with, you know, to get every dog is a pet or something that obviously doesn't go through here. So Percival will agree. If he starts at PX, the alchemist will transmute his armor to silver. And that's why he will get through the demon disjunction but he will be stopped by the angels in the universal quantifier. So no copying here in accord with our judgment. Um, so this is our DDS in short. I wanna mention one little important thing about it. It's representationally minimal in the sense that the only data structure that you need to use it is the formula itself. If you know other uh, deductive systems, let's say Gensen's natural calculus, you will remember that, that uh, the proof in those systems like a tree, right? So it's basically a tree of formulas, a tree of trees, if you will. We don't need anything like that. Everything we need is already in the original formula of our original formal language. Yeah? And importantly here, uh, what we have so is we have premise scope, which governs the relation with, uh, between the premise and the, the target. And this premise scope is computed by Percival. We could also say that uh, this is Percival's first job in the service of our uh, DDS, but we will soon give him another job uh, because we will talk about aboutness, conservativity, and restrictedness. So you are probably familiar with conservativity as defined by Barwise and Cooper, and then later proposed to be a universal property of natural language determiners by Keenan and Stavi. I think this is, you know, everybody these days agrees that this is a really a universal that has stood the test of time. Now, in our book, we generalize conservativity uh, somewhat and claim that it is a formal statement of aboutness. So what do we mean by aboutness? Something very, very trivial. So look at this sentence here. This sentence is about Joan, it's about buying, it's about red stuff, it's about apples, it's about markets. It's not about Peter, it's not about sleeping, it's not about blue stuff, it's not about pears, and it's not about houses, right? So sentences of, a language, uh, of natural language are really about the objects denoted by the words of the sentence. And if this looks trivial, it's probably because that's how your language works. <laughs> but in maths, <laughs> it might not be as trivial. Yeah? Let's first, let me first give you a bit of a more formal de definition of aboutness through conservativity. So one way to think about this, about our generalized conservativity is that if you have a formula and it's got some truth value in some model, right? So you may shrink down the model a little bit, yeah? Uh, 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 but you shouldn't shrink. So uh, if you're only removing the, 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 the individuals that are not referred to by the words or rather predicates in the formula. Yeah? And if you do this in this way, you're sure not to change the truth value. Now, if your core formula is non-conservative, the following can happen. So we borrow this determinal null from Larson and Segal. Um, this determinant does not exist, of course, yeah, in no human language as far as we know. So the idea is that null cats are black means that everything but cats is black, or equivalently, everything is either a cat or black. So let's consider the upper model first. So I've got these four colorful cats, I've got three bats, and I've got this chicken, let's say it's brown, okay? 
Uh, and obviously, this sentence, no cats are black, is false here because the chicken stands out. It's neither a cat nor black. But now, you see, so if this uh, sentence is really about cats and black th things, we can take away everything that's neither cat nor black. So we can take away this chicken and the truth value shouldn't change. But of course, the truth value changes because now the chicken is gone. Everything is either a cat or black. Uh, so this was an example of a non-conservative and non-existent determinant. However, what we are really interested here is in the form of conservative formulas. Yeah? And it turns out that this form uh, actually is, uh, we, it's called restrictedness. So conservative formulas are restricted. What does that mean? Actually, you already know. It means that every quantifier in the formula has to be restricted, and you're familiar with restricted quantifiers. You know that the existential, uh, in the restricted format, the existentials are friends with conjunctions, and the universals are friends with implications. Or because we don't like implication, we want to write it using negation and disjunction to be in the Boolean world. Uh, then universals are friends with disjunctions and also require the restriction AX to be negated, unlike the existential quantifiers where it shouldn't be negated. Uh, but now this, this A here is an atomic formula, right? Mm -hmm. However, in practice, all semanticists use complex restrictions in the sense of black cat here. So, you know, there is an X that is both black and cat. Now, what is really noted here is that the structure of the restriction matters in the sense that not every formula, if you stick it into the restriction, is going to give you a conservative result. So let us stick in not CX as, as here, so not cat, into the template of the universal quantifier restricted one. Yeah. So what we will get, because the double negation cancels, is every X is either a cat or sleeping, what we really get is the meaning of no cats are sleeping. So we get a non-conservative meaning as we have seen earlier. So this is not a good restriction. Not every restriction is good, but what does a good restriction look like is our question. And this is a question that Percival can help us answer. <coughs> okay, bear with me. Um, a quantifier over a variable x is going to be restricted when Percival can do the following. Yeah? So he should start his journey from a restrictor, the red thing in these examples here, and the restriction needs a restrictor needs to be uh, needs to be an atomic formula with x as a variable. So monadic atomic formula with x as a variable. He needs to start wearing his golden armor, and he needs to reach every other occurrence of x. I mean, that must be possible for him. Or alternatively, he needs to reach to the other side of, uh, uh, of the quantifier. That is an equivalent formulation. So let's see what happens in these three examples. The first two are conservative, so everything should be good. The last one is not conservative, so Percival should be unsuccessful. In some black card, he starts at cx gets through these true conjunctions because angels live there who like gold and arrives in the nuclear scope all is well in the every case he starts at cx gets through the first conjunction gets transmuted to silver and therefore he can get through the demon disjunction into the nuclear scope all is well but no he starts at cx gets through the first conjunction, but then because he passes two alchemist towns, he is back to gold and cannot possibly get through this disjunction. Failure of restrictedness. Um, so note that we have developed Pisco because we use it in the, our deductive system. Yeah? It has nothing to with, do with restrictedness. But now it turns out that we can use P-scope and our friend Percival in determining restrictedness. So basically restricted it, we get it for free. Uh, and once uh, we... You have to yeah. Me today. yeah, thank you. And uh, once we have restrictedness, we can actually get predicate logic without quantifiers. So how do we want to go about this? Let's take you know formula with quantifiers, 
imagine that we deleted all the quantifiers from this formula. Another question is, could we possibly reconstruct these quantifiers? And in general, that of course won't work, but it turns out that if the original formula was restricted, then we can do this in a unique way. Yeah? So what we will propose is an interpretive rule, a restricted closure, which sort of reconstruct the quantifiers and actually also their junctions, although we don't really want to say that something is really reconstructed, we consider it an interpretive rule that tells us how to interpret a formula as if, you know, those guys were reconstructed. Let me show you how restricted closure works. So here on the right, you have the quantifierless tree, the quantifierless formula for sentence, the black non-happy dogs are barking. It's quite complex, right? And as you can see, there are no quantifiers in this tree. And you can also see there are no conjunctions and disjunctions in this tree. We have erased their identity. You on, we only have the branching nodes and they could be either a conjunction or a disjunction. And we're gonna bring all this back by restricted closure. How? First, we will find the closure positions. Obviously, the quantifier of some variable should be high enough to bind all the occurrences of the variable, but it actually turns out that pushing it as low as possible is the only good option. So variables will be closed at the lowest common ancestor of all the occurrences of the variable. The question mark, uh, so the type of the quantifier is, as, uh, is unknown as of yet, and so is the junction immediately below it. However, what we do know is that all other uh, junctions are conjunctions. And then we will attack the types of the quantifiers by bottom-up recursion. So we will start with the quantifier for Y because it is embedded in the quantifier for X. And how do we do this? So we will find a potential restrictor for, uh, for the quantifier for Y. So this is an atomic formula such that Percival could possibly reach the top or other to the other side if the question mark was resolved correctly. So let's try HY first. We sent Percival up, he's transmuted to silver. Oops, cannot continue. HY is not a potential restrictor. DY perhaps, starting gold, still golden, still golden, transmuted to silver. And now he will definitely be able to reach the next node, but he will be able to enter into this town only if this is a disjunction because he's wearing a silver armor. So only if we have universal quantification here. Uh, accident, incidentally, if Percival was able to reach the top from some other atomic formula, so if we had two potential restrictors, the math guarantees us that they would always agree on the type of quantification. Done. We do the same for X, everything is golden here. So we get the existential quantifier. We are done. This tree corresponds to this formula below. We have reconstructed it, all the quantifiers. Finally, finally, we can back, get back to our interface business. So I'm adding uh, our quantifierless L Nova uh, among the candidates for you know who is isomorphic to LF award. As mentioned earlier, generalist quantifier is certainly not first order logic, perhaps a bit better, but not. Well, our quantifierless version of predicate logic it looks much better. We'll just fix one final detail. Let me stick a true here, right? This is gonna be a conjunction anywhere, so who cares? And now these two trees are perfectly isomorphic. Of course, restricted closure uh, will then fill in the missing information, so to speak, will tell me where the uh, quantifiers are and so on and so forth. So basically, uh, I can really simply read my logical form, my LF, as the uh, formula of quantifierless L nova. Yeah? Uh, in a way, the logical form really starts living up to its name. You know, it really is that the capital letters logical form is the lowercase letters logical form. So how do I read this? So the black stuff is the syntactic stuff. 
the blue stuff is uh, uh, so uh, lexical, um, uh, lexical semantic stuff. The red stuff is computed by restricted closure. Yeah? So we have already seen this example. You see everything matches perfectly. Let's take a look at the every example. So here is one little thing. So where does the negation come from? Well, our idea is that, of course, every brings in the negation. So in minimalist terms, it contains a interpretable negation feature. Well, there is one little detail that we still need to take care about. So we were used to uh, syncategorematic negation. So uh, the negated constituent was below the negation, but let's yield to natural language syntax here and switch to categorematic negation for negation that should be okay. Of course, there is more to say about the isomorphism between LF and LNOVA. So you might wonder where the predicates come from, where the variables come from. Well, my idea here would be that, you know, lexical roots are monadic predicates, other syntactic heads like, you know, uh, agent and theme would be dyadic predicates, and that perhaps variables would correspond to extended projections. But that's a topic for another talk, I would say. Uh, so let's take stock here, yeah? So, if we are into the standard semantics business, we have this departure from uh, the minimalist architecture of the language family, but we don't need this departure anymore uh, under our zero interface quantifierless LNOVA story. There is no more need to map, uh, to, to have a mapping from syntax to semantics. So semantics now fits into the proposal, uh, into the minimalist proposal. Perhaps we could also also say that this is an important step uh, towards proof theoretic semantics if this is something that you like. For me, actually, you know, as a working linguist, it's also very important that this way, uh, syntax and semantics, who really talk to each other a lot, even in mainstream semantics, will have to collaborate even more, right? There's going to be no proposal in, from syntax that has uh, that does, wouldn't have syntactic uh, semantic consequences. And conversely, every semantic proposal will have immediate syntactic uh, uh, consequences. Now, I would love to go through uh, these things uh, with you. Uh, like we have a really nice story, I believe, about the donkey anaphora problem, which simply dissolves. Uh, but I will not go into this because in the in the interest of time. Uh, so let me conclude by saying that I, I think that this zero interface, right, is like uh, just completes the circle that we have started with in the book. So we started with the idea of, okay, we wanna have natural long logic. We want to have logic, a deductive system that works on natural language expressions. And finally, we have developed this deductive system. But then we have used its central component and went to use, uh, to, to define restrictedness with it, with it. And restrictedness led us to the quantifierless format of first order logic. And then if we add, you know, this affability uh, thing with LNOVA in there because to, to show that we really can use first order logic also for most and stuff, we can arrive at our zero interface. And now if we use our dyna dynamic deductive system at the zero interface, we have actually gotten a, a nice uh, natural logic deductive system, I think. Um, of course, uh, there is many more details here, and I sincerely hope that you pick up our book and read upon those details, and we are looking forward to your comments about that. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. That was really, really interesting. So now we can move to the Q&A. Uh, yes, Jan. Yeah. Um, thanks. I mean, <clears throat> really, so fascinating stuff. I um, I must read the book. But um, <clears throat> just a whole bunch of things occurred to me. But two things, mainly because I'm just interested in them at the moment. So the first thing, do you have an account of a difference between weak and strong quantifiers? Uh, okay. And especially how they connect with existential there. Um, 
So I don't think we have a full account because I haven't thought about this uh, uh, specifically yet. Um, however, it might be the case uh, that the strong quantifiers are gonna be the ones that have complex restrictions. If you remember the, the definite article, so it had a quantifier inside the restriction of another quantifier. And that's sort of quite peculiar. I think this could be the key towards the strong versus weak determinants. Okay, okay cool. Not and sure could, though, not sure. Yeah, no, I mean, it's obviously nobody quite knows what to say about the weak strong distinction. So, so. Um, the other thing was about, <clears throat> So movement, so for what I could see, there was no account of how, so I mean, you know, syntactically, you standardly you think of quantifiers as undergoing some kind of movement or mm -hmm. something like that. Uh, whereas on, on your presentation, there's no real account of um, movement. So is, is there some um, explanation, so for why there is movement in the syntax or how the movement mm. is reflected in the semantics mm. so yeah uh thank you um so i didn't mention movement because uh, movement happens in the syntax and I, our idea is that we simply work with whatever syntax gives us so uh the lf uh, as i presented it is the lf with all the quantifier raising already have happened as on all other standard stories, other uh, other semantics, which anybody who works from the, the LF, we work from the same LF. So movement happens. We don't explain why movement happens. That's, I think, not the job for us. So we are only concerned with what happens later at the interface uh, to say basically that nothing <laughs> happens, but, uh, but yeah. Oh, we really, I think this is something that Peter talked about yesterday. Uh, we really want to stick to whatever syntacticians give us. So we would never in our wildest dreams say there is no movement or let's say no covert movement because we want our semantics to dovetail with whatever syntacticians uh, give us. We do have one little thing, however, it was, you know, at the bottom of, uh, of uh, syntax semantic talk uh, uh, that I had, uh, something what, what if we could contribute, it's a bit of a crazy idea, but let me say it out loud just for the record. Uh, so, headedness. Why are syntactic structures endocentric? Um, now, the wild idea is that perhaps they are endocentric because of restricted closure. So let, let me, um, no, I'll just tell you, I don't have it in the slides, I deleted it. Uh, so it turns out that if you don't designate one of the two branches just under the quantifier as special and call it restriction, then the entire system simply doesn't work. Then you can have, you know, AX combined with not BX, and you can't decide whether you've got an existential or universal quantification there, right? So you have to say one of them is going to be the, the restriction, and well, that creates the asymmetry. And perhaps this asymmetry is the source of headedness, is my crazy idea. That's interesting. Yeah, good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Yuli? Yes, uh, thank you so much. It's very interesting and very attractive as um, because it's it's uh, really minimalistic. Uh, and of course, I need to read the book to understand it and to maybe some of my questions won't make sense because I misunderstood it. But uh, one question I have some, I have many and I'll ask well, three, I guess. So one small question. Uh, Yuri Zarland recently had a whole project in Zas showing that there are non-conservative natural language quantifiers. So I was wondering if that will, that would be a problem for your system. That's mm -hmm. question number one. And May I just answer the questions as they come? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If there turn out to be genuine non-conservative determiners, then we're fucked. 
It's as simple as that. <laughs> so we have really a lot at stake here. We claim that those cases can't be genuine. Yeah? So we would, I would really want to, I'm not familiar with, uh, with that work, but I will really want to look at it and uh, try to find out where the problem is. I mean, I'm optimistic because uh, there, you know, in, in the past, there have been a couple of determiners that were allegedly non-conservative, but then every time it kind of turned out that they were conservative after all, if you look at them carefully enough. So this is how I would go proceed here. Okay, yeah. Nice. Thank you, thank you for, thank you for telling me about this. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, um, the other two questions, they are kind of, uh, personal in the sense that these are things that I am as a linguist working at and if I want to uh, uh, to, to, to apply your system which I of course try after I read the book then what I'll need it to do is to make a distinction between uh, things that, that are anti-additive like negation and downward entailing but non-anti-additive Okay. And as far as I understood, your system gets it into the deductive part, which means that I will be in trouble there. Or maybe I misunderstood it. Uh, well, let me let me share the screen. <laughs> let me share the screen just a little bit uh, because we do talk. Um, is this what I want to share? Do you see our book? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we did think about negative polarity items a little bit, and we did think about additive and anti-additive and so on and so forth. Uh, um, um, uh, 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 determiners. And actually, we tried to cook up a formal characterization of those environments. And it turns out that it's not a particularly difficult formal characterization. So it has nothing to do with the, our deductive system. It has nothing to do with Percival, or at least, it, you know, as far as we, we've gotten, perhaps there is something deep in there. Um, but the general idea, I believe, pays off in the sense of um, fine, we've got all these model theoretic properties that, you know, people are investigating and are getting great results out of that. But can we see something new if we look at them from a proof theoretic perspective? Uh, and we believe we can. I mean, so we looked at conservativity from a proof theoretic perspective and we've got restrictedness and we were blown away, right? So, of course, here with additivity and the multiplicativity and the anti-versions, we, you know, just, you know, looked at that from very much afar, didn't go into any details, but, you know, perhaps there is gold there as well. So I would just say, the, the general idea of, of investigating the form rather than only the, the model theoretic properties, uh, we believe will pay off, or rather we hope will pay off. Th does that answer the question? Yeah, apart from the last part, can you elaborate on your last sentence a bit? Like investigating the form is a part of its model theoretic properties. Can you expand um, on it in one more sentence? Uh, <laughs> I mean, look look at our conservativity. Yeah? So we everybody knew that determinants are conservative, right? So this is a long-standing result. It's a model theoretic result, and uh, so we looked at how do conservative formulas look like, and they look like you know they are restricted in this Percival in this Percival sense. And once we have this formal characterization, it was like, does it bring us anything? new and yes in fact it brings us a whole new system where we don't uh this quantifierless format which we believe has a very big advantage compared to let's say the gq story because what you do in the gq account is you have all these possible determiners you know people have counted them right you know we know how many there are and then you zoom down to the conservative ones and it's just little this little corner of the space, right? Are the conservative ones. <laughs> so you first overgenerate wildly and then you filter out. Yeah? In our system, you can't even possibly represent a non-conservative determiner. Yeah, because our quantifierless format forces everything to be uh, to be restricted. 
Does well, yeah, okay. I, it, it does. It, it helps how to go about uh, with the uh, with the negation case. At least the idea. Okay. Good. And my, my last question, then, it's a kind of big one, or it's either a big one or a yes no question. So then you're talking about LFs. How big your LFs are? I mean, are they tracking the discourse information that I want to get in, or are they yes. just stop at uh, whatever level so, you want to? Discuss? So what we the, the examples I gave in that we give in the book are these very little things, and no, 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 we don't think there's a there are these little things. So as I answered earlier. Uh, anything syntacticians give us. So if syntacticians give us these sort of trees, let me say even better, yeah, even better because then we have stuff to work with. And that definitely, in my personal opinion, uh, includes the discourse stuff. In fact, I'm getting ready to work with Moreno Mitrovic on this uh, discourse stuff. So we are trying to, uh, you know, do the formal thingy with the, the exhaustification operator from formal pragmatics. So we want to work on as big a structures as possible, basically. Yeah, just whatever syntacticians give us. Good, excellent. Thank you so much. Very interesting. Thank you. Okay, uh, Alan. Yes, thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have two questions. One is one is small, I suppose, and related to one of the previous questions. Can you put up your slides again um, yeah. with the tree with the tree with every where you have done. Um, um, the feature negation, the syntactic negation feature. So I wonder uh, what the uh, difference would be when instead of every you had no, would it have a different uh, kind of negation feature? Uh, uh, yeah, so the, the idea, the, uh, the, the basic idea would be that uh, we would have to buy one of the pretty standard accounts, let's say uh, that this uh, negation in every is interpretable and maybe that one is no is non-interpretable uh, but I I know that this is not really a complete story because I also we need a way to distinguish between negative concord and double negation languages so there is work to be done here there is work to be done here uh, but I don't think anything really speaks against having a negation in every in fact so one of these things that we that I didn't talk about yeah. <laughs> Uh, so the negation feature in universals might explain the puzzling interaction between universals and sentential negation. And by this puzzling interaction, I mean the fact that every dog doesn't bark is not really a good sentence, right? So our idea is that perhaps this is an instance of relativized minimality. So you're trying to move every that contains a negation over the sentential negation and everything is ruined. Uh, uh, there are, of course, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, if I could interrupt a second, I think the question yeah. is not, a, he's not really concerned about the negation and every, he wants to know what no A's or B's looks like. So yes. do you have a, something from the book where you could show how no, uh, no A's or B's works? So no, mm. no dog barks, right? No dogs, no dog barks. Yeah, no dogs bark, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I would definitely go for simply a negated version of the, of some dogs bark. Uh, that that I think would be uh, my take. But do we say anything in the book on, on that? Peter? Yeah, we do. Um, so Where in, the L, in the L star version, we had neg negations over both dog and bark. And then in, in the El Nova version, we have the two negations over the existential. Uh, yeah, I mean, from for us actually, I mean, for me at least, both both would be possible. Yeah, um, I have no trouble with, with either of them, and it's also easy to represent them. So, uh, if you just take uh, ax, join it with bx, right, and then put a negation on on top of all that, you're gonna get existential closure below because this is the LCA of x, and it's gonna be negated. So the but now whether no is a negated existential or a universal of negation, I mean, that's, uh, that's really a, ends up being in my, in my view, a syntactic, in syntactic question. Uh, 
So whichever yeah, so works question, better for syntax. So that, that was actually my question, how the syntax would differ, right? Because you mentioned this this negative feature on every, right? I would expect a feature like that on mm -hmm. no, and how do they differ, right? That, that was my question. Okay. Well, as so, I, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so should I definitely, ask another question? No. Okay. Uh, I will just try to answer something from, you know, from thoughts that were not very well formed uh, a while ago. So every needs to function in a way that negates only the restriction. So I would say it doesn't move anywhere, this feature. Whereas the feature of no, we know, let's say, if you would take the Begelis towel story of the, uh, so there are different positions for different types of DPs, and negative phrases have their own position. So the negation in no would have to be the kind of negation that actually needs to uh, needs to get uh, into agreement with this negative phrase projection of Begelian style and move in there. And therefore, it would then apply higher than our negation in every. Of course, zillion details to work out here, but this is how I would do that. Okay, so to me, it looks like you have to stipulate something funny in syntax to get your semantics right. Sorry, that was a biased comment. Yeah, I have. <laughs> okay. Uh, we, uh, I'm, I'm fully aware of this. So I'm fully aware of the fact that we are possibly the first people ever to say there is a negation in every. Huh? <laughs> that, that is the heart of your comment. Yes. Can I ask another question? So please do. That, that was okay. That was supposed to be a simple and fair question. I have uh, an unfair question, namely, have you thought about polyadic quantification? So you know how to deal with different. Or you mentioned negative uh, concord, which it seems to me is best analyzed in terms again of, of presumptive polyadic quantification. Is I mean, would your theory be helpful uh, for dealing with that, or would that um, be a problem for your theory? Yeah, thanks. I mean, the, the negative concord, we we would simply say that's a syntactic issue. So there are in, uninterpretable features on on various items, such as Noben Nikche. I mean, and then negation is the only one that has the interpretable feature. Uh, or, you know, okay, there negative concord is a complicated thing, of course. So there are details to fill on, but I would go along with the story of interpretability of feature. Now, if there is anywhere that we really need polyadic quantifiers, or maybe anywhere we really need branching quantifiers, I don't know. Is there anywhere that we perhaps need something of a higher order? I don't know, perhaps. So we are trying, what you're trying to do here, I think it's a bit programmatic. So we are trying to see how far can we get just by uh, plural, uh, plural uh, first order logic, which is, as you know, anyway, uh, second orderish. So it's equivalent to monadic second order logic. So we are trying to take as weak a logic as possible and see how far we can get. So we are in principle not against extending our logic if necessary. However, we what can block this extension is these results concerning polarity. Uh, and conservativity, so they hold only for a limited class of formal languages. Uh, so they hold for normal predicate logic, and they hold for this uh, L omega one omega, which is an infinitary logic. And they, but well, it is not completely known where precisely they hold. It's um, we ha you have to see where Linden's theorem holds and where Pfefferman's theorem holds. So it's a bit of an involved procedure. So extending it, the logic is possible, but you have to take care that, put it very bluntly, negation can still shine through your logic. So in, if the order is too high, then it stops shining through and giving us all these lovely results that we needed. Okay, thank you. I think that if there are no more questions, we can go to the last break. Ah, sorry, Jan. So yeah, it was just just a very small question, really. Um, in, in your trees, they were headed by um, uh, S, and I was just wondering, does Percival have a problem if your structures are headed by some kind of inflectional 
element? No, no, no. no. First of all, he doesn't care about syntactic categories. <laughs> He's a purely <laughs> semantic guy. <laughs> and we put in the S only, you know, just we wanted to keep things as simple as possible in, in the book. Clearly, yeah. we sentences are CPs. We're fine with that. Yeah, yeah trust yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Okay, right. Okay, so we see each other in 20 minutes. Uh, David or someone, can I make sure my uh, screen sharing works? Yes, I wanted to, <laughs> to suggest the same. So try again, uh, be before trying it, um, maybe you can do this. Uh, take the window of your PowerPoint presentation and make it smaller. So it, it shouldn't occupy the whole screen. Uh, George, you are, uh, I cannot hear you. You are silent. Oh, yeah. Ah, okay. Now, yeah. George, I cannot hear you. Okay, good. Uh, the question is how to get this onto slideshow because that option is is somehow uh, lost when I go to this. And I tried putting it on slide uh, on slideshow right away, um, and it's on the screen. Are you seeing play from the start at the top of your uh, window? Oh yeah, there it is. Oh, oh good. Yes, now uh, it works. <laughs> oh, I didn't realize that. Oh, somehow it switched. Okay, that's great. Okay, okay, so that's fine. Is that right? Um, as is? Yes, I, I am seeing what we should be seeing. Perfect. Okay, good. I'm going to stop share for now. Uh, and I'm just going to go through the uh, you know, slides to make sure they're right. Okay, so we're meeting again in 15 minutes, 20 minutes, I guess. Yes. 15 minutes. Okay, thanks. Thanks, David. Okay, see you soon.